Hello, good morning, evening, or afternoon, and welcome to the laboratory walkthrough for the natural circulation ex evaporator experiment. I'm Mark Roberts, and I'm a co-instructor for the Chemical Engineering 3070 course at Clemson University. Go Tigers! Okay, so the purpose of this uh, video is to outline the expectations for your preliminary report and to introduce you to the equipment for this particular experiment. Okay, so your preliminary report is going to consist of four parts. Okay, the literature review, objective general methods and data tables, sample calculations, and the procedure. Okay, so for the literature review, I'm just going to start by giving you a little bit of an idea of what, about what my expectations are for each part of this report. For the literature review, I'm not really interested in reading a book report about evaporators. Actually, I won't read it. What I want you to do is I want you to tell me what information is needed to help you do this particular experiment. Uh, for example, what is your expected delta T in this type of measurement? You know, as a chemical engineer, you know the relationship between steam pressure and steam temperature, and you know the temperature at which water is going to uh, which water is going to evaporate. So you should be able to give me an idea about what your expected delta T is. Uh, what is your expected value for the heat transfer coefficient for a shell and tube type heat exchanger? Um, with this, with this information and knowing the area provided in your assignment, you should be able to give me an idea about what your expected evaporation rate is for the different measurements you um, achieve here. Um, that said, this experiment is also going to involve rotometers, and please do not tell me about rotometers in your uh, literature summary. We all know how they work. You do not need to tell me anything about rotometers. Okay, the second part for the preliminary report is going to be your objective general methods and data tables. Okay, so I view this role in the preliminary report as somewhat as a project lead because it connects all the different parts of the experiments together. Um, for this part, you, want, you, you need to restate what your primary objectives are for this particular experiment. Again, calibration, verification of the road meters is not a primary objective. Um, you also need to provide data tables, and your data tables need to collect all the necessary measurements from your experiment and provide that data to your sample calculations. You can do calculations to provide the information that's requested. Okay, sample counts. Again, I'm going to refer you to the information provided in the course in terms of the sample counts. But the general idea about sample calculations is you want to provide all the necessary calculations that take your measured values, Okay, so the values you're going to measure are going to be things like temperature, uh, pressure, mass, and time. You want to take these measured values and convert them into useful information like Q, what's the rate of heat transferred from the evaporator, the rate of heat transferred um, from the steam, from the condenser cooling water, etc. And then how do you use these to calculate your heat transfer coefficient, U, for this experiment? Right, and also there's a design component that you should provide some information on how to calculate uh, the design objective for, for your experiment as well. Okay, and the last part, which is we'll spend the most of the time today talking about, is procedure. So your procedure should tell me specifically, precisely, in as few words as possible, what particularly you need to do with this equipment here in order to collect the data necessary to determine your heat transfer coefficient, and to do your design scenario calculations. Um, again, your target audience for your procedure should be a sophomore level chemical engineer. And by that I mean any sophomore level chemical engineer. So really think here about the lowest common denominator. Someone who's passing you know, your 211, 2110 classes and thermal classes who is going to be joining you in this type of class. A general rule of thumb I, can, I, I like to use when, when thinking about writing the procedures is is pretend you're, you know, your colleague is here sitting next to you and they're not going to do anything unless you tell them specifically what to do and how to do it. So that's the level of detail and precision you should use within your procedure. Okay, so now that we've discussed your expectations for the preliminary report, let's go through the experimental apparatus for this equipment. Okay, the first thing you need to do is a safety analysis. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint. Don't burn yourself and don't trip and fall over something. Those are probably the two main hazards uh, that can occur uh, doing this experiment. Also, you'll need your safety hat and your eye protection when you're inside the designated area of the laboratory. Okay, so this experiment consists of a couple of key pieces, like here's your evaporator, which is um, in a glass chamber so that you can see the, 
level with the evaporator, which will be the same level inside the um, heat exchanger. Okay, so we have the heat exchanger shown here in red. The liquid from the evaporator will be on the, the tube side. Steam is going to enter on the shell side of the, uh, of the heat exchanger, where a measurement of the pressure is shown here. Um, when the water evaporates, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to move up and be condensed in this condenser over here. And the condenser has a, an outlet flow so that we can measure the flow rate of the overhead condensate. Okay, the unit also has a couple of rotometers. Okay, so the rotometer on the right is your rotometer for the evaporator feed. So this also has a valve where you can switch between evaporator feed and calibration. So your procedure should include some, some, um, some instructions for either calibrating um, this rotometer or verifying the calibration curve that was provided depending on what your assignment is. Okay, there's another rotometer that's for the condensing cooling water. So this condensed, this flow rates here. We don't actually, you, you can calibrate this if you choose. You don't necessarily need to do that because you can actually measure the flow rate um, coming out of the cooling water. So the flow rate coming out of the cooling water, you can just follow the tubes and what you'll see is this black line right here uh, will give you the flow rate coming out of the cooling water. Okay, so now when, when, we, when we're getting ready to run this, so there's a couple, of, you know, the, the order in which you do things is important. You know, first of all, the, the main thing you want to think about is Absolutely do not turn on the steam if there is no liquid in your evaporator and if the cooling water for the condenser is not turned on. Okay, so that, those are the, that, that's, the, that's the most important thing about this particular experiment. Otherwise, it's fairly safe, fairly, fairly easy, fairly routine. Okay, so shown here is the feed water to the evaporator. Okay, so again, you can just follow the lines. The feed water to the evaporator is going to come into this unit, okay, where there's a water meter for the feed and for the condenser. Okay, if you follow the, follow the line coming out of the evaporator feed, you'll see that it enters the evaporator down here at the bottom of the heat exchanger. Okay, so this is how you can fill the evaporator. Okay, so if we turn on the feed, again, what we want to do is in, in, in this experiment, we can either operate batch or steady state. So we'll even need to fill the evaporator for the batch measurement and let it drain. And if you're operating in steady state, you need to make sure the flow of mass coming out is the same as the flow of mass coming in. Okay, so if the feed water coming in is uh, if, if you set the feed water coming in, then you um, select the target level for your evaporator. Without any steam, what we need to do is open the product flow rate for the evaporator. Right? So if we're doing a concentration type measurement, we're going to be feeding a dilute solution, evaporating off the solvent, and we're going to be drawing off the concentrated product at the bottom of the evaporator. Okay, so I'm going to close this so I don't entirely drain the evaporator. Okay, so we can, again, turn the, the cooling water on. I want to note also here we have uh, temperature measurements uh, for various thermocouples. Uh, if we want to measure the, the temperature of the water coming into the system, it's going to be the same as the temperature of the water entering the condenser, which is measured by TC1. So temperature of about 72.8 Fahrenheit. Okay, so again, now we, we have this turned on, and again, the next thing we want to do before we turn on the steam is we want to we want to make sure this the condenser is nice and cool. So I will. Uh, use the flow on the condensing cooling water to control the flow to the condenser. Okay, so a measurement of the cooling water temperature coming out is going to be TC2. Okay, it's important for this measurement that you have at least a 10 degree difference or as close to a 10 degree difference in the temperature entering and exiting the cooling water to give you the most accurate determination of how much heat is being pulled out of this condenser, of this, uh, of this condenser for the overhead condensate. Okay, so with, with that set, then we can, again, to do the evaporation, we need heat. We can get that heat by applying steam, or by supplying steam to the heat exchanger. Okay, so the main supply line for the steam is shown here. Again, there's another valve to control the steam flow or the steam pressure to the, to the evaporator. So the maximum pressure you're going to be able to get on this system, because again, it's medium pressure steam, it's going to be about 30, maybe 32 PSI. Okay, so I recommend, you know, if you get, if you want it, get this heated up as quickly as possible, I want to use the highest steam pressure, which is going to be your max steam. Okay, so we turn this on. Once the water starts boiling, once, once the water stops, starts boiling, what you're going to see is the water is going to start circulating, I'm going the wrong way. The water is going to start circulating in this, in this system. So we're boiling the water in the system. Water is going to be pouring out of this unit. So again, we want to make sure this level doesn't get too much higher than it already is. Right, and as it's boiling, some of the water is going to be evaporating and coming, across, coming off the top. 
Important other, other important things, thermal couple four is going to tell you the, the temperature of the water boiling. Again, you should know what that is ahead of time. Um, other temperature measurements, we have TC5, which is connected to the temperature of the steam. But again, you already know that the temperature and the pressure of the steam are related to each other, and you can get that information from the steam tables. But again, it's just another data point that you can use to, to verify some of your experimental um, information. Um, Again, you know, that kind of gives you the gist of this type of experiment. Um, on, on shutdown, you want to make sure that you're closing things, you know, more or less opposite of what you did to turn them on. Again, most important, you want to turn off the steam first before you turn off any of your cooling water. So that, that essentially covers the basics of this experiment. Um, we can talk about this more in our individual walkthrough. So when you're in the lab for this experiment, you're going to, you're going to want, need to collect a few key pieces of data. I've already pointed out up here the temperature measurements for a variety of locations in the system, such as the temperature of the cooling water coming out, uh, the temperature of the overhead condensate coming out. Right? You'll also want to take note of the pressure on the steam, which is pressure in PSI G, not just PSI, so this is a gauge pressure. Um, okay, in addition to the temperature and pressure measurements, you're going to need mass flow rates. Right, so you'll likely need you know, the mass flow rate that comes from the calibration. We discussed that earlier. You can also measure the mass flow rate of the steam condensate coming out. So that'll be through uh, this tube at the bottom of the heat exchanger. There's an exit or a product stream on the evaporator shown here. So you can open the valve to empty the evaporator or draw off the product stream if necessary for your experiment. The flow rate of the overhead condensate, again, all you need to do is follow the lines and you'll see that this black tube over here will give you a way to measure these different flow rates. Now using these different flow rates and the temperatures, you can use your energy balances to determine what's the amount of heat added to or removed from the various components of the system. And then combined with your overall energy balance, you can determine what's the heat transfer coefficient for the system. Using the heat transfer coefficient, you can do your design scenario calculations and determine the right evaporator that's necessary to do the job that's requested. Sometime soon, we're going to have our individual group. Well, we're going to have our individual walkthrough where I have an opportunity to ask you questions, and you have an opportunity to ask me questions about this experiment or the experimental apparatus. Okay, so some questions that I might ask you could be things like, well, have you watched this video? Have you come down to the lab and actually looked over the experimental apparatus and thought about how you might do this experiment? Um, I might ask you questions like. What's the delta T that you would use to calculate your heat transfer coefficient U for this experiment? And is that delta T a delta T log mean or just a straight up delta T? Some questions you might ask me are, well, how do I turn on the water? Right? I might tell you to go back and watch the video. Or you might ask me things like, should I expect there to be a maximum in the heat transfer coefficient with delta T, as we see in one of the tables in our textbook? I might tell you I don't know, even if I do know. But again, these are some things that you can learn through the experiment. Um, you also might ask me things like, you know, what is TC1, 2, 3, 8, 4, etc. And again, I can refer, refer you to this video and you can kind of fast forward or try to get to the point uh, where we talk about those things. So good luck. Look forward to talking with you and working with you on this experiment.